Welcome, welcome everybody. My name is Sean and today we have to talk about yet again a country that I've been keeping my eye on, which of course is El Salvador. We're going to talk about their gang crackdown, we're going to talk about the positive indications in the numbers, and we're going to go over exactly what led to this crackdown so you can understand the context in which Nayib Bukele operates with but before we get into that i just want to thank the members actualjusticewarrior.com slash join where you get early access to videos on the secret video page I will give me the money give you give me the money okay and my podcast listeners apple spotify and google's podcasting platform it looks like a sea of skin and tattoos these images released by El Salvador's government shows the transfer of about 2,000 inmates stripped to their shorts and with their heads shaved to what's been dubbed the country's new mega prison. So if you haven't seen it, I suggest you look it up. I'm going to put it on screen for you right now of the massive gang crackdown going on in El Salvador. In a single year, the El Salvadorian government essentially rounded up 60,000-ish suspected gang suspects. They opened up a mega prison, the largest in Latin in America to warehouse these people and people have been reacting left right and center to the video of gang members essentially being transported to this talking about the supposed lack of humanity involved in this whole process but one of the things that rarely gets the coverage that it deserves is what inspired this and we've talked about on this channel how in 2015 El Salvador was the most dangerous place in the world in terms of homicides how 0.1% of their population population was murdered in a single year, a horrific number that we could never even imagine in the United States of America, and that was the norm for about three years in a row in this country, and how crime has been the number one issue in El Salvador for a very long time, and Bukele initially was elected on promises that he would deal with the gangs after two consistent left-wing administrations essentially let them run wild. I mean, some of you will remember during the Trump administration when he tried to remove some El Salvadorians who had come to the United States as refugees post an earthquake and the reason they had their refugee status extended was due to the fact that the gang violence was just off the charts after the damage from the earthquake went on but the thing is describing this as gang violence describing this as something that you might see in the United States of America really underscores how bad it was in El Salvador essentially what was going on in that country is is the most effective terrorist organizations in the world were operating and exerting control over the government through a series of massacres every time that they wanted to get something. And this all came to a head when the attorney general actually ended up outing that Naib Bukele was doing secret negotiations with gang leaders in order to get them to cool it with the violence on El Salvador streets. Now, Bukele, for his part actually denies that this was happening but the thing is i don't believe him i'm gonna be very supportive in a lot of instances of things that naib bukele was doing however i actually do think that he was negotiating in secret with the gangs but eventually he ended up learning his lesson that that was not the best path forward and to be clear i don't think this is just a bukele administration thing i think a lot of latin american leaders are convinced that you essentially have to find a way to live with these people these monsters on your streets rather than fighting against them now after this was outed el salvador experienced one of the most violent days in their history since their civil a war over the course of a weekend. The country's main gangs, MS-13 and Barrio 18, appeared to indiscriminately kill people, including vendors, bus passengers, and market growers during the three days of bloodshed, with 14 killings on March 25th, 62 homicides on March 26th, and on March 27th, they closed it out with 11 more, accounting for 87 homicides in the course of 72 hours. Now, again, this is not your standard massacre. This was a deliberate targeted attack, mostly in the capital of El Salvador, of everyday citizens, taxpayers, civilians, in order to send a message to the El Salvadorian government that the gangs were in fact in control. Because after this outing ended up coming out, the gangs supposedly feared that Bukele would 
withdrawal from negotiations, so they wanted to send a message to him and his government. And we know this because the local press reported that gang members probably were instructed to leave the bodies in plain sight. One of the corpses was found visibly dumped on the side of the road. Other people were dragged out into the street, all so that they could be seen by the public, all to intimidate the government of El Salvador. Now, although this was an extreme even for El Salvador, it's important for you to understand that this was not an abnormal tactic for gang members. Long gone were the days of open warfare between the gangs. What they actually would end up doing consistently was stage these massacres every time they got something from the El Salvadorian government and then they wanted more, and a perfect example of this was a massacre just a few months earlier in November of 2021 that left 46 people dead. Same kind of scenario, civilians. These were women walking with their strollers with their babies, vendors on the streets, bus drivers, everyday people massacred, and then their bodies were left out in the public for other people to see to send a message again to the El Salvadorian government that things were not in their control. And this is one of the reasons why this is beyond gang violence. These are terrorist attacks. That 87 people, when you factor in the fact that El Salvador is a population of 6 million, essentially is worse per capita than the terrorist attacks on September 11th in the United States of America. And this was a standard operating procedure for the El Salvadorian gangs post the gang wars and the 6,000 murders and all that in order to intimidate the government and show them who was boss every time they wanted to negotiate for more power. El Salvador's head of prisons describes the El Salvadorian gangs as what they actually were, an alternative form of government more brutal than anything almost on the face of the earth. They tried to create a parallel state. El Salvador's security minister likens the gangs to terrorists, insisting the crackdown was necessary to rebuild society. And of course, you, you can see the people on, on, on our street with hope. But the thing is, this tactic, even though it used to work, even though it was a great maneuver for the gang, terrific, obviously, but a great maneuver in order to extract the concessions that they wanted, and I believe it worked with the Bukele administration, this particular massacre was the straw that broke the camel's back. The largest death toll in El Salvadorian history since their civil war in the capital, San Salvador, was just a bridge too far, and Bukele ended up doing a 180 on this negotiation strategy and totally changed the game in El Salvador. El Salvador's Legislative Assembly approved Nayib Bukele's month-long state of exception, suspending constitutional rights such as freedom of assembly and loosening rules on arrest. The measures also permitted military roadblocks throughout the country. El Salvadorian authorities later announced that they arrested over 570 gang members in the space of two days, including two leaders who had allegedly ordered the homicides that of course, rip the nation apart. Bukele also took to Twitter and posted the following, because of your actions, your homeboys won't see a single ray of sunlight. The president said, in the same March 27th Twitter post. Now, this was just the beginning. This was just a starting point, the catalyst for the actions that we've seen in El Salvador because Bukele's emergency powers, which, by the way, have to be reauthorized by the legislature each and every month, have been utilized to now arrest over 60,000 gang members. The El Salvadorian prison population is now near 100,000, and there's a lot of complaints from American human rights officials, the United Nations, and all these organizations organizations that didn't seem to care about the reign of terror that was going on in this country, about how they're locking up more than 1% of their population. But the thing is, if you compare their homicide numbers today to their homicide numbers at the peak, they're down about 92%. If you compare their homicide numbers since the implementation of this policy to the previous year, they're down over 50%. But bringing down the homicide rate is just one of the effects of this policy, because in reality, in actuality, the homicide rate was going down during this secret negotiation strategy. Again, the gangs, instead of committing great acts of violence consistently, would just alter the level of violence so that the public can be scared, so that the
the government can produce concessions, but overall, they would keep the bodies to a minimum in order to have the good press for Uber Kelly, because essentially they were trading the lowering of the homicide rate for the perks and all the stuff they were receiving from the El Salvadorian government. However, other crimes in El Salvador were not decreasing along with the homicide rate, because again, and homicide is very important, that was the primary focus of the Bukele administration before the crackdown. So extortion was a very common practice in El Salvador. And there are countless accounts of these vendors, these small businessmen, these people just trying to operate in their own city, being told that if they don't pay the gangs, then they're going to have their family chopped up into bits. And unfortunately, if you happen to be one of these legitimate business owners in disputed territory, you could wind up in a scenario where both gangs are threatening members of your family in order to receive payment, and you could possibly be killed or have your family be killed if you're caught paying off the other gang. So it would be an absolute disaster for citizens in El Salvador. They lived in a constant state of fear. However, since the crackdown, not the negotiations before the crackdown, we've seen extortion numbers fall dramatically in El Salvador. According to El Salvador's transportation minister, bus companies alone in the nation of El Salvador have reportedly saved over a six-month period $50 million in extortion fees that they were paying to the gang. And by the way, let me make this clear. This is listed as $50 million USD, not El Salvadorian currency, US dollars. So they're being crippled by this. How can you operate a bus company in a country of relatively poor people if you're paying that much money over a six-month period in extortion fees to the gangs? And by the way, I said it before and I'll say it again. Oftentimes, as reported by many news outlets, the extortion fees would go up during holiday seasons. In a city just outside the capital of San Salvador, a 45-year-old mechanic, Manuel, said that he had paid extortion money for 12 years. Every two weeks, he gave money to the hitmen from MS-13 who threatened to kill his wife and four children if he did not pay. He was often forced to fix gang members' cars for free, and during the Christmas season, he would have to pay double. But since July, not a single person had come to collect a payment. Quote, I feel calmer. I can go for a walk. I can go for a walk every night with my young children, he told Reuters. Before, I didn't even take them out. And again, this is not an isolated incident. 70% of El Salvadorian businesses pre this crackdown face some form of gang extortion and micro extortion, which is 10 to 15 bucks a month from the smallest of small businesses, food trucks, all kinds of little industries in El Salvador, nets MS-13 $31 million a year, which if you break it down is about $65 a month per member, which might not sound like a lot to you or me, but that's actually a minimum wage salary for an agricultural worker. Think about what this money could do in the hands of the legitimate economy of El Salvador. $864 million is the cost in these three Central American countries, including El Salvador, Honduras, and I forgot the other one, of gang extortion. This is all money just being yanked, extracted by the barrel of a gun from everyday citizens, a lot of them running the smallest of small businesses, not making a lot of money to begin with, all under threat of death, all under threat of murder. And when you're trying to quantify this, it's actually incredibly difficult because talking to foreign journalists, being caught explaining how much was being extracted from you by these gang members could have led to death for so many years in so many of these countries and specifically in El Salvador. Hey guys, editing Sean here. So the original article that I was looking up and referencing when I was shooting this video said around 834, 836 million. However, the updated numbers are actually 1.1 billion from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. 1.1 billion being extorted from the legitimate economy by these gangs from poor countries. You know, in my previous videos on El Salvador, I would get comments, and I'm sure they're already under this video right here, about how we need to implement this in the United States. We need to use this against American gang members. But honestly, that really shows a lack of understanding of the situation that is going on in El Salvador. The fact that this person wouldn't let any of his four children outside because he feared that they would be killed by gang violence or forced to join a gang is something that... Just just a modern American who's grown up even in some of the worst areas in the United States 
cannot possibly understand. The idea that you would be forced under threat of your wife and children being brutally tortured and murdered to fix gang members' cars to pay them extortion fees on top of that. And during the holiday season when you might want to do something nice for your family, that gets doubled is just something that, again, people can't understand. And the economic depression that people of El Salvador have to suffer with because nobody wants to go to these shops unless they absolutely have to for fear of them being controlled by gangs, for fear of street violence, for fear of these massacres is again just beyond the pale of what we could understand in our modern western context here in the united states of america and if you're in europe a place that consistently throughout all of history has had a way lower homicide rate than the united states of america you doubly can't understand it el salvador was losing due to extortion and the violence and all these problems with the gangs 15% of their GDP each and every year under the previous regimes, under the previous policies. $4 billion a year, 15% of their total economy was being wiped out by these criminals. If you needed any clearer example, by the way, of crime driving poverty and not the other way around... 15% of the GDP of a poor country. This is one of the reasons why it's kind of laughable when the American media or the Western media or the United Nations or any organization that's suddenly concerned about the human rights of these gang members calls this a controversial program. Nayib Bukele is the most popular leader in the world right now. This policy in particular has a 92 to 94% popularity depending on the poll amongst the El Salvadorian population and that even factors in the fact that 2% of the El Salvadorian population is in prison due to this policy largest incarceration rate in the world and a giant drop in criminality throughout their nation and I'm assuming that 2% would be in the nay category so among the law-abiding or unincarcerated El Salvadorians we're looking at something like four to six percent of that population opposing this plan that's it show me a government program anywhere in the world that's as popular as what Bukele is doing to these criminals and by the way it goes even beyond locking up the gang members it goes even beyond them trying to fix things for everyday citizens and by the way we're going to get to the economic data in response to this it's also about changing the culture of El Salvador one of the things that they're doing and Bukele has geniusly labeled this like a form of denazification is destroying the gang landmarks, destroying the graves. Now, some of you might feel a little bit dubious about seeing people take sledgehammers to these monuments, but essentially, this is even beyond what we would expect from a regular crackdown because he's trying to eradicate any visages of these gang members, anything that could lend them any glory, to essentially remove them from the face of the country. The government's not just locking up living gang members, but also expunging all trace of those who've died. By destroying their graves, they are dismantling their legacy. The crackdown has brought peace, but at what cost? Dan Rivers, ITV News, El Salvador. And for people on the American left in particular who seem to be offended by this, who seem to be upset by these images of destroying these monuments to criminals, I just want you to think about how you felt about statues of founding fathers and Confederate statues in particular being ripped down during the Black Lives Matter riots. You were all fine with that. However, gang members that have caused more harm to individuals who are actually alive in the nation of El Salvador, for some reason, that is a bridge too far for some reason removing that from the culture is an issue for you for some reason that's something that you got to stick up for it doesn't make any sense at all especially again from an American context especially again when you think about it the El Salvadorian population is so behind this policy it's absolutely insane now El Salvador like many Latin American countries especially Latin American countries that just had leftist administrations in charge for a long period of time has a ton of debt and that unfortunately is quite burdensome for El Salvador and this is something that they need to address however they are doing so since the crackdown El Salvador's government has actually had their credit rating raised by multiple different institutions multiple different times because the outlook on their credit worthiness is stable the fact of the matter is 
companies that do this for a living are looking at the situation on the ground in El Salvador, looking at the growth, which, by the way, is pretty solid. And I'm not counting the giant out of COVID 10% growth. I'm talking about the consistent 2 to 3% growth that they've seen post the crackdown and realizing that what we knew and what we say on this channel all along is 100% true. Crime drives poverty, not the other way around. I mean, again, think about what I was talking about with that bus company and that $50 million USD that was being extracted from them over a six-month period. That's $100 million being shifted from the legitimate economy, from the taxable economy, to these gangs. Not to mention the fact that when they would target civilians, they would deliberately target people who were merchants. And by the way, they were also extorting a bunch of merchants. The fact of the matter is, tourism, all these other industries were negatively impacted by the gang violence. So although El Salvador has spent a lot of money on incarceration and a lot of people will say, oh my God, look at how much their prison budget has risen by, the fact of the matter is the impact of getting those people off the street, the impact of the overall economy is positive. And what you can see by some of these hardcore sharks of credit agencies is that they realize that. On top of that, Bukele has made a commitment to get their fiscal situation under control. So while they're putting more money into prisons, they're actually doing other things economically in order to stabilize the country. On top of that, El Salvador has embraced Bitcoin. Now, I'm not somebody who who's big on trusting crypto, but at least as a strategy to draw in some crypto people and some outside investment, all of these things are good to go in order to assist the country's growth. Because once you remove the extortion element from the economy, once you remove the chance of everybody at your job being massacred by these gang members who are pseudo other government that's extremely violent, what you'll find is that investors will be interested in the nation of El Salvador. On top of that, we're also seeing other indicators from other Latin American leaders that they want to pursue the El Salvadorian model. And again, there have been gang crackdowns in the past by various countries. A lot of them stupidly focus on just cutting off the head, which ends up leaving a power vacuum, which ends up causing more violence in the short term. But in reality, this strategy of locking up all these gang members has great downstream economic effects for all of these nations. So all the human rights organizations and all the people that want to attack Bukele, who, by the way, is pursuing a second term, which is not allowed in El Salvador's old constitution. They're trying to change it so he could just run again and obviously is a red flag for those concerned about authoritarianism. Don't realize that this strategy working so well on so many different levels is going to spread because other nations in Latin America will demand it. Honduras will demand it. Colombia will demand it. And when you think about these countries in this little Central American triangle, the violence that they consistently put up with, and the fact that that fate is not signed, sealed, and delivered, and the potential economic growth of being a stable country that has a decent rule of law, that's safe for investors to put money in, right next to the United States of America, you'd have to be crazy not to try it. Look, Bukele is not perfect. He is not without flaws. He is not without worrying signs and all of that. But the fact is, he stumbled onto something which is a basic truth for any civilization. Without rule of law, you're nothing. Without rule of law, you have no chance of prosperity. If you allow gang members to become so powerful that they're essentially the most effective terrorist organizations in the world, then you're never going to have any kind of prosperity. El Salvador was heading for a sovereign debt crisis. If they continue to negotiate with these gang members and continue to have no economic growth because they were spending all this time trying to avert these massacres that were being done essentially to extract more concessions from the El Salvadorian government, they would have eventually hit a fiscal crisis lost all their money, and the violence would have percolated again. This was their only solution to this problem, and there's a lot of issues with it. And I've said over and over again that I want these people tried. I want these emergency powers to eventually end and for these people to end up being convicted of their crimes because I do believe in rule of law. I do believe in due process. But the thing is, every single time, and this is quite telling, I bring up some of the downsides of El Salvador, I am contacted by a bunch of people from that nation or who have fled that nation telling me that it's worse than I'm even describing. Every single time I say, hey, you know what? 
Like maybe the tattoo suspicion thing is a little inappropriate. I'm told things like regular people in El Salvador don't get tattoos because they're terrified of it being misinterpreted as a gang tattoo and being killed by a rival gang. I'm told stories and sent videos like this one of this woman who found both of her children decapitated by these gang members over a petty dispute. My life ended the day they took my children away from me. Yvette Toledo lives with the legacy of their murderous reign. She has permanent police protection after her son and daughter were decapitated by the gangs. My life is very different now in every way. They didn't just take away half of my life. They took away my dreams and the future I had with them. I'm shown the horrors of a soccer field meant to be fun for the community, a nation that loves soccer, being the site of executions mid-game in front of thousands of people and nobody being able to do anything. These neighborhoods that were no-go zones that are now safe for commerce, that people now feel comfortable in. Some of the poorest areas of El Salvador now at least not being the most dangerous areas of El Salvador. The corner of the football pitch was where gang members executed anyone who resisted them. The kid was from a rival area controlled by the Magma gang. Ellen Nielsen remembers the bad days during a match he saw gang members killing a 16-year-old player in front of hundreds of spectators. The man shot him. Then he took out the magazine, put another bullet in, then shot him again. He shot him about 20 times. Now there's a speech that I played from Nayib Bukele in my last video on this topic. I'm going to play it again, and even though it's subtitled, remember, I have podcast listeners, so I'm going to be reading the subtitles for you guys who can't actually see the video, so you can get the gravity of what he's saying. ¿De dónde les nació ese amor repentino por El Salvador? Si hasta hace poco no sabían a dónde quedado en el mapa. De repente, en estos tres años, han surgido todas las preocupaciones. Where did they get this sudden love for El Salvador? If up until recently, they couldn't find it on a map. All of a sudden, in these three years, they have grown concerned. Where were they before? ¿Dónde estaban cuando estos partidos de la esquina reclutaban niños y los obligaban a matar? Ahí están. Arena, el FMLN. Reclutaban niños para mandarlos a matar. Nosotros les damos computadoras y laptops. Ellos los reclutaban para mandarlos a matar. ¿A dónde estaban? Where were they when those parties in the back corner were recruiting children and forcing them to kill? They are right there. Arena, the FMLN, who recruited child soldiers and sent them to kill. We are giving them computers and laptops. They recruited them to kill. Where were they then? El Salvador es un país libre, soberano e independiente. Tomamos nuestras propias decisiones. El Salvador is a free and sovereign and independent country. We make our own decisions. Eso lo tiene que tener claro el mundo entero. Queremos tener buenas relaciones con otros países. Queremos ser aliados, amigos, socios. Let that be clear the world over. We want to have good relations with other countries. We want to be allies, friends, partners. Pero de verdad, amigos, aliados, socios. Pero no colonia. But truly, friends, allies, partners, not a colony. Ni patio trasero, ni patio delantero, como le quieren decir ahora. Nuestras puertas están abiertas de par en par. Pero no permitiremos que nos vengan a decir qué hacer. Not a backyard or front yard, as they are calling it now. Our doors are wide open, but we will not allow them to come and tell us what to do. Look, the truth is, if you listen to Bukele, if you follow him on Twitter like I do, you understand why he's so popular. There's a lot of truth in his statements, and so many times the American population or American media refer to different parts of the world as America's backyard or different countries' backyard or front yard or whatever, and he's sick of it. They are a sovereign nation. We have to let them govern themselves in the way that they seem fit. Obviously, concerns about human rights the world over are important, but the fact of the matter is, this level of concern was just non-existent before in El Salvador, when they had the shadow government that was attacking people. A lot of people didn't want them to do anything, they just wanted to blame the American drug war and talk about how it was all our fault. 
But the thing is, they can't address the American drug war. It may feel good for a lot of people in America to throw their hands up and say, well, the global south is in poverty due to the global north and colonialism and all that, and then call it a day, pat yourself on the back, and act like you've accomplished something. But the thing is... They're still dealing with the gangs and all that. They have to craft interventions that are within their power in order to solve those problems. And that's what Bukele did. And that's why he's one of the more popular figures in the world. And he's probably going to go down as the most popular figure in El Salvadorian history. And other Latin American leaders are following his lead. And we might actually see one of the greatest crime reductions in Central America due to the fact that Bukele stepped up when it mattered the most and he showed others the way. Look, I want you to look at the worst stories that you can find about this policy. I want you to look at the one guy that the BBC keeps highlighting that is supposedly innocent, that's caught up in El Salvadorian's prison sweep up, and understand that there are likely more actually innocent people being brought in. I want you to look at the greatest horrors of this program so you can judge this as sharply as humanly possible, but I also want you to acknowledge the state of El Salvador before and where they are now and where they're headed into the future. I want you to understand that in the most extreme example, we have discovered this truth that I've been pushing on this channel time and time again, that the poverty was being driven by the crime not the other way around. El Salvador didn't have a great economic improvement. They had a great incarceration program, and that's what led to their crime being reduced, and that's what also led to the economic indicators improving so dramatically. They still have a long way to go. They still have to stabilize their laws, their economic laws, in order to make them simpler, in order to attract more outside investment. But the proof in the pudding is in the taste, and guess what? The El Salvadorian pudding tastes pretty good right now. If you're a person in El Salvador, go read the citizens' accounts. There's a reason you're supporting this. But hey, those are just my thoughts. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you liked the video, show them by leaving a like. Subscribe for more content. Follow me on all my social media. Support me via the support links in the description of this video. This has been me talking about Bukele's success. Till next time.